Well, welcome to the first panel of the day, everybody. Very exciting stuff. Kicking off with the how to get a jobs in games art panel. Uh, this panel is essentially for anyone who is curious on how to get a job in games art, anyone who might already have a passion or interest in the subject, and for anyone who might already be in games art and how to take your career to the next level. So uh, for anyone tuning in, this is uh, the first panel of the Into Games Careers Fair. It's a one day event taking place here on the live stream until five o'clock and also in the Dis Into Games Discord server. So if you're not in that, get in that now. So um, yeah, make sure you stick around for the rest of the day. We're gonna have more panels, more studios coming in and portfolio feedback and networking live in the Discord. So um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, so my name's Tom, if you're in the Discord already, you probably been annoyed by me constantly pinging and spamming you all day. Um, so hello, lovely to meet you. Yeah, um, panelists, would you like to introduce yourselves? We'll go with from left to right for me. So Shay, would you like to say hi? Uh, hi, I am Shay and I'm a 3D character artist. I am self-employed and have been for about three and a half years, but I've been working in the industry for about six. Uh, so, yeah, I started off in a generalist position where I worked in like 2D, 3D effects, engine work, everything um, for the first two and a half years of my career. Then uh, I was made redundant, which was the best thing to ever happen to me. Um, and then I went freelance and have been uh, successfully working that way for the past three and a half years where I have nine released titles in the past three years. So. Uh, it's a pretty fast paced job, which I really like. Um, but yeah, and then I spend a lot of my free time trying to do things like this and give back to the community who has helped me a lot over the past three years. Hey, fantastic to hear. Um, Anya, would you like to say hello? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Anya. Uh, I am an environment and concepts artist working in games. So I started out uh, in 2016 at Creative Assembly as an environment artist and have since then slowly moved my way. Ooh, I'm very blown out. Uh, I've since moved <laughs> <ghostly>. my <laughs> I know <laughs> I've moved my way into concept art and now freelance full time doing a bit of concept art and a bit of environment art uh, and also a bit of uh, background illustration as well. So I can't really choose what I'm doing. Uh, so yeah, currently working as a freelance concept artist for Gameloft, uh, who also I work for, uh, Supercell, Amazon, uh, Rare, on Everwild, uh, so yeah, bit of everything really. Oh, fantastic stuff. And uh, Rory, if you want to say hi to everyone. Yeah, morning everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, Tom. Um, yeah, so I, my name's Rory, I'm a concept artist. Um, I studied at uh, Abertay University in Scotland, where I'm from, and then I joined Dalawa Studios in Essex in 2016 as their uh, concept artist. Um, so I've been there for five years now. Um, we're working on a really exciting NDA project right now, but, uh, so I can't talk about classic, but um, uh, we released Battletoads um, last year, which is kind of what we're most known for now. Um, but yeah, that's me. I've played hundreds of hours of that, so it's a, <laughs> but I'm trying not to gush really hard right at the moment. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. But, but yeah, so look, we've uh, let's jump right into it then. So what we did was we put out a little uh, question and art into our Discord server and asked all the artists in there some questions about how to get a job in games art. So we'll just uh, whack the first one off the bat, which is how do you go about networking to get a, a games art position without making it seem like you're only interested in them for what they can give you. So um, maybe Shay, if you want to start off with that. Oof. Uh, a, I know it's a rough one right off the bat. But... Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's about making genuine connections. You can't just approach someone because of what they can give. Um, I guess from my own experiences is that when I say I'm self-employed, a lot of people don't want to hear what I have to say after that point, because they assume that you're between jobs rather than actually having this as your job and career. Um, so quite quickly, you do see people lose interest in a conversation and move on. Um, but I think a lot of it is also giving, giving back what you take. So if you're talking to someone about something, 
at least like thanking them, having appreciation for them and their time, uh, trying to talk to other people, like be active in the community rather than just, this is what I want and then never speaking to anybody um, again. And a lot of, in games especially, a lot of networking events aren't particularly professional, like super hyper professional. They are very casual. Um, so you can just have a conversation with someone and just like ask them what they do, what they're interested in outside of their work. Because a lot of people also don't want to talk about their work all day, every day. Um, but it is just about building genuine connections. Because with freelancers, we really like stick our necks out for each other and support each other. Um, because we have those deeper connections with each other. Um, and so a lot of work that I get is from other freelancers recommending me to clients that they can't take and vice versa I do the same for them so I think getting to know people on a personal level rather than just can you give me portfolio advice and then banish into the ether I think is probably um what's worked for me anyway yeah so sticking around and being part of a community and kind of getting in not not basically just being there for the work but being there for the industry it seems kind of the takeaway yeah, yeah. Um, Anya and Rory, do you have any uh, comments on that? Um, I think for me, uh, the only thing I can particularly think of where I've met people and I've been like, this person is 100% just in it for like connecting and then vanishing into the ether is when I've been at events, someone comes up to you, they introduce yourself themselves to you, and then they give you a business card and then walk away. And I've had that happen a few times and I'm like, oh man okay well I guess I'll keep your card but I'm gonna forget you quite quick um so yeah like Shay said it's kind of about more like making those actual kind of friendship connections um so I've been to my favorite event that I always went to which I don't think is happening anymore but it was this event called industry workshops which a lot of us would go to and you just kind of you go you hang out and you just chatting to people and it's kind of it's a bit less about trying to make acquaintances and you're making kind of friends and it's about you know over the course of a few years and it is unfortunately a slow process but it's that kind of process of attrition you meet someone the first time and then a year later you might meet them again and you begin to remember that person and you know and things online as well like you see them on twitter or whatever as well so there's sort of a few avenues but it's it's over time as opposed to being a quick thing so get started today yeah <laughs> get out there and start getting networking today and um yeah build your circle up rory what's your experience with um approaching people to kind of make industry connections being like yeah yeah um a lot of what, what she and i did just said to be honest but like also i think um it's good to remember that like not all networking has to take place in physical spaces as well like kind of and touched on at the end there's you know a lot of people aren't able to kind of jump around go into these like networking events or stuff um and like you know if you're not comfortable in physical spaces as much you know there's like plenty of ways to build amazing communities online and stuff which is just as just as valid um like twitter being the main one that kind of springs to mind yeah um, <laughs> totally, yeah um but yeah, like the there is there's always, um, you know, like the, there's like nepotism is a thing. It does exist, but the kind that I've encountered in the games industry hasn't been the sort of like bad sort of like rich dad shoe in kind of thing that you know like from from like films. But like it's been like a kind of more organic sort of like natural social kind where just like you know like it's 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 someone's approached a networking event with like. Um, like as an opportunity for like obviously creative inspiration but like just general fun social experiences as well to like meet like-minded people and it's always all the good stuff's always come from that to be honest like it's never been like Shay said it's never been anything super formal to like for me personally yeah, yeah. at the end of the day you're making video games and video games are super fun yeah. so yeah like, <laughs> what's not to love yeah so we'll, we'll move on to a bit of a more sort of art focused question uh and this is a vet this is more, a bit more of a generalist one but it's essentially someone is asking, um, if I'm confused between which art field to choose, how do I make the right decision picking a field? So essentially they're, they're more sort of a generalist artist at the moment, probably starting out in your career and you're getting a bit overwhelmed. You're seeing like, oh, tech art, environment art, concept art, character design, loads of stuff. How did you kind of whittle down what field that you wanted to go for? Do you want to start off with Shay again? We just go around in a little circle like that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess mine's more. I'm 
uh, I don't know about other people's experience, but because I did start off as a general artist for about two and a half years of my career, for me, I just, which thing was I always going back to? Um, I did a lot of um, overtime, not in my studio, personal overtime, uh, at home where I was working on pieces just for fun. And it was always 3D characters that I was making. It was never anything else. And when I came up with projects and things that I wanted to do, it was always characters and people. It was never, oh, I really feel like making a house today. Um, so for me, that was kind of just like following your gut instinct of what you enjoy the most. But also a lot of people don't pick a field. They do everything and that really fulfills them. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure to like be a specialist but being a general artist is just as valid and just as like uh, appreciated and valued in the games industry as being like a specialist also. So if you don't know which one to pick, um, you can continue doing all of them as long as you enjoy them. Um, but pivoting is also a thing. I know artists who pivot to being designers or programmers who pivot, uh, pivot to being writers and nobody's really doing the same thing for like 50, 60 years. I think what our industry allows you is to pivot and just change your career, you know, if you want to. Yeah, you, you heard that programmers, today's the day you pick up that pencil. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I definitely agree with Shay. Like you don't, you don't necessarily have to, there is a lot about kind of specializing, you have to specialize. And I definitely say there is a market for people that are more generalized whether that is you are a concept and environment artist like i have done or whether you want to be a character artist and an environment artist in the 3d side of things um there's always overlap that is appreciated between fields uh and i've generally found that there is room for those people and as long as you are doing what you enjoy it doesn't really matter because you're, I think what you enjoy is always going to change over the years as well. So you'll kind of find yourself sort of snaking your way through different fields or, you know, things that you like, even within a specialism, you might be an environment artist and you start out really enjoying doing sci-fi things. And then over time, perhaps you find that you actually prefer doing more fantasy kind of things. So there's a lot of layers to specializing that you don't really have to stick within necessarily. Cool, nice. What did your kind of career path look like out of interest? Like, so did you did you pivot from something else beforehand or did you were you just like, I know I want to be an environment artist from the beginning? I, I had the exact problem of not knowing what to do with myself. Um, I started out doing, well, at university, I learned to do kind of more realistic stuff because that was the what we got taught, the kind of basics of 3D in, uh, art in general. Uh, and then I kind of ended up, I guess, just being drawn more towards kind of fantasy, colorful environment art. And over time I found what I like and I just kind of doubled down on it a bit more. And then I also have always enjoyed 2D painting, which is why I, I do both. I enjoy both. I'll do a concept for an environment and then make it in 3D for myself. So I have both elements in my portfolio and it's it's done me okay, not specializing too hard. Nice, cool. So kind of keeping yourself more open so you can get, you're more sort of, uh, like free for more job roles essentially yeah absolutely it's probably a good thing because uh i kind of always have some kind of work whether it is concept art or background illustration all right it's good stuff rory how's your trip into art been <laughs> um mine's mine has been pretty pretty um pretty simple um i kind of like realized pretty early on that i wanted to be a concept artist but like there's still i think just like a for like early career folks and students, I think like a general inquisitiveness is just like a healthy thing to have, you know, like to, to sort of want to, you know, use, use that sort of time to sort of, um, you know, dip your toe in like different, you know, different things and, and sort of see what, see what gives you that gut feeling that's, that she kind of mentioned, um, if, if there is that. But then in the long term, that is, again, um, like we said, that's one of the most exciting things about this industry and about the creative field in general is that you can, you can sort of, you know, pivot as your life, you know, there's, you spend a long time in work and there's like lots of opportunities to pivot around roles. Um, and there's been 
sort of specialization pivots that I've had in my own role that have sort of changed quite a lot, depending on not just sort of like how, where I'm at, but also just where the project that we're working on is at. You know, like with, with smaller studios, you can sort of like pivot to different ways to whatever opportunities sort of arise when they arise. Um, but yeah, like a, a general sort of like um, inquisitiveness, just like I guess in general, it would be my would be my would be my thing. You know, because you, 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 it is possible that you will meander around things as your sort of tastes develop and your interests change. Yeah, I mean, that, this is a really good segue because we see a lot of people asking, like, if I'm going into art, into games art, how much kind of coding knowledge do I need? Like, do I need to know any kind of technical knowledge? So do, do you have any experience sort of coding on that more technical side yourself? <clears throat> um, not particularly. Um, no, I mean, there's... Um, there has been sort of like well, we work we work with Unity a lot, so there's been sort of like that was something that sort of I had to I had to learn on the job. But there's uh, a lot of times now when we're hiring, that's like a big you know that's a bonus if like if there's artists that have taken that sort of like in, interest to sort of learn how how the game you know because Unity is so art friendly, it's kind of like a it's it's a it's a, it's a it's a really good opportunity to sort of learn more about the sort of general pipelines for either 2d or 3d 3d games um so i think yeah like trying free services like like unity and stuff is definitely a good show hmm. cool good stuff so um yeah now we're going on to a more sort of employment focused question so this bit of a long it's but i'll split it into two parts so someone's asked what are employers typically looking for in an art portfolio is there something that sets apart any particular applicant from the others so yeah, if we go back to the top, Shay. <laughs> oh, um, I might pass this on to Rory because obviously That's I don't right. do any hiring myself. Um, okay, all I can sure. say is that people that say they like my work is just that they like the range in it, but that's all I can really say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's a good takeaway anyway. So like having a big range on your portfolio of stuff to, to sort of showcase your different talents. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rory, do you have a two cents on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so range, range is definitely a huge, it's like a huge one for sure. Um, but then also like it's it's good to sort of be aware that you're, like the one thing um, sort of I've looked for in the past was sort of like the, the person applying is looking for the right job. You know, that they're applying to the right job that reflects their portfolio, the, the, the sort of style, that the, the game that we're working in and, and that sort of thing lines up with the work that you can clearly tell from the portfolio that they genuinely love doing, you know, because you want to find that sort of like that, that right fit where, where someone's um, um, going to, you know, like going to want to work in the style and, and really enjoy it. Um, and um, I think sort of like a, a sometimes like, a, I guess, just like a general comprehensive, like, art fundamental understanding is like always good. Um, anatomy is sometimes like a big giveaway, you know, that there's still like some things to be learned, um, but just like like a kind of tasteful use of like different, different, um, yeah, different fundamentals like light and color and balance and like confidence and those sort of things. Um, but then also like, I think there's sometimes like a bit of a stigma with fan art and portfolios. It's um, obviously a conversation folks kind of love to have, but. Um, I think like with how popular adaptations and stuff are in games right now, um, and like, you know, um, especially, I mean, we worked, we worked on Battletoads, which we essentially did fan art for two years when we made that game, you know, it was existing IP kind of technically. Um, and so if, if, if I, in portfolios, if I see fan art, that's like taken an existing IP and done something really interesting with it, that's really exciting for a studio like ours, you know, that sort of like, you know, deals with a lot of existing IP. Um, so I, th I think. You know, I'm not saying like um, it's amazing to fill an entire portfolio of fan art because obviously with things like concept art, you want to you want to sort of you want to let your own voice you know shine a lot and sort of like show that you can develop your own ideas and that sort of thing. But sort of little you know sprinkles of fan art that you've done really interesting things with and pivoted towards different different audiences, different genres, those sort of things. I always find really like specifically interesting to see um, from my own point of view. So you, you can put your Naruto OC on your portfolio, but as long as it's drawn really well, like you're going to get in essentially. 
yeah, I get, yeah. If it, if it if it says if it says something really interesting, you know, and it's um, and it's done something cool with the IP, then hundred percent. Cool. So, like, so Anya, what's on your portfolio then? What made you stand out for to employers? Uh, uh, who knows? <laughs> um, what is on my portfolio? Well, I have. Um, I guess this kind of goes back to the sort of generalization thing. I've always had quite a big mix of stuff in my portfolio, but generally I have, I, I tend to do kind of personal 3D projects somewhat rarely. Uh, they will usually take me about six months to do, uh, you know, on the side of doing work or living my life. And so I have at any one time in my project uh, personal portfolio usually like w maybe one to three 3d projects um and then the rest of it to be honest tends to be 2d stuff because it's quicker it's it's easier to do so it it just happens that way um but my 3d stuff for people that are looking into going into 3d environment art they tend to be kind of mostly finished projects i don't really have sort of single props unless they're like hero props really finalized beautiful props that are sort of centerpieces in an environment so i tend to do actually kind of full environments they usually take the form of a diorama because they're quicker to do you know it's not an entire environment um but i take kind of nice beauty shots from different angles everything's textured it's they're not hero props so nothing is kind of immaculately perfectly textured it's it's mostly about the overall scene as opposed to singular assets um but i have two or three of those in my portfolio so when i'm looking at portfolios um i tend to be looking for kind of a mixture of kind of full environments where someone has demonstrated that they have a good overall sort of fundamental environment design uh, understanding uh, and then also a couple of props if they're going hardcore into sort of the environment artist role uh, to show that they can do more finalized singular props as well. Cool. Do you have any quick tips on how to like put a good composure together for these kind of environment scenes? Like how how do you draw focus to like those environment props that you really want to show off? Um within do you mean within like an environment a full environment how yeah, yeah. so if, you, if you've made like a little dior like a diorama scene for a portfolio like and you want those big those props that you put a lot of effort into to kind of be front and center without directly putting them front and center <laughs> how about how about would you sort of go around that yeah there's a few tricks you can kind of utilize uh often uh lighting can be super useful to you know uh if you create an environment and you want a particular prop to stand out using lighting to kind of make that area be the focus. Um, so often a hero prop will be kind of the more detailed prop in an environment. So sometimes contrasting the detail of that hero prop against a simpler environment surrounding it can be quite useful. Um, making the hero prop or the area where you really want the focus to be quite contrasty in relation to the rest of the environment in terms of the lighting, the color, uh, values. So there's, there's sort of a lot of things you can use, but generally a hero prop, if you want that prop to really stand out, is going to be kind of more detailed than the rest of the environment. Cool, cool. Awesome. That's a really great tip. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so we've got a more sort of specific a uh, 3D focused question, which I'm going to launch at Shay now. Um, is Blender as equally a viable option as Maya or 3DS Max these days? Ooh, yes. We're getting um, ready with this one. <laughs> yeah, no, I, so I know quite a few successful, very successful Blender artists that are moving to like big studios like Airship Syndicate. Um, from my experience anyway, I was taught in 3DS Max. Um, and then when I joined a studio, they were like, well, we're going to need you to switch to Maya. I think the important thing to remember is that it doesn't really matter which software that you learn on. It's just being able to learn and adapt and move to other software if you need it. You know, like it's not even just 3D. If you're learning to draw and say like Photoshop, but your studio uses like Studio Paint or something, um, you need to be adaptable to be able to change to what your studio or project needs. 
Um, being a freelancer, I can use whatever software that I have access to. If a studio uh, needs me to use something else, then my rates go up to accommodate that price. But stereotypically, a lot of the time, in my experience, they just want FBXs. So you can do that in any software that you have. Um, Blender is a great free resource for a lot of people, whereas even though Maya has Maya Indie now, it's not available across the planet. It's still £300 a year, which, again, is expensive for a lot of people. Um, and as much slack as Blender gets and as much of a meme that Blender is, um, it's still a very good resource for people to be learning and taking hold of what they do. And it's fundamental modeling skills that's adaptable to anything. Um, and it's the same with any art skills or most skills. If you know how the fundamentals of art then learning 3D is much easier because, you know, design, shape, form, color, everything like that is in 2D art too. And you just translate that over and learn the tools. So, yeah, I think learning Blender doesn't make you any less of a 3D artist or make getting a job any harder than someone if they knew Maya. A lot of studios are willing to give you the time to acclimatize to the software. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So... So like you'd say that Blender's a good sort of entry level, um, like if someone was just going to pick up 3D modeling and like you'd recommend them to try and learn some Blender skills that then they could then transfer maybe to maybe Maya or in, in a studio kind of setting? Yeah, for sure. Like not all studios will ask you to switch. I think some studios do use Blender or they'll be like, we have access to Maya, but also you can use Blender if you want to, if it's like a small indie studio. Um, it really depends on what that studio's needs are. You just need to be flexible, which is the case of like any role, even in programming, you might learn one language, but a studio might need you to learn another. You know, you, you need to be flexi flexible, flexible <laughs> in every part of your job, really. And learning constantly is a big part of this industry because things are getting added to it con like all the time. So yeah. we're always evolving, um, which is a blessing and a curse. So um, yeah. <laughs> would, would you give any sort of top tips to someone who's just like starting out in 3D art? Um, I think the best thing for me is like start small and do it often. Um, there's a lot of temptation to like make the biggest, baddest project that you can think of, which I think only sets you up for disappointment when you're learning. So setting small projects where you're always learning something. Um, all of my personal projects, even now, I try to be like, I want to learn how to do this thing, like hand paint a texturing, or I want to evolve my anatomy skills, or I want to evolve my hard surface skills. I'll base a project around that one goal and then use those small projects to build up into a larger one. So now you've learned all these things and you can take those and compact them into something that's much bigger. Because if you just do the bigger project, you're going to end up like me where you spend like 10 to 12 months making one character because you've remade them like 17 times because you're not used to the process or the sheer amount of things that you're learning in one go. Um, and I was really yeah, disappointed with myself. Yeah. And you just get down and a bit uh, lose motivation and it's really difficult to continue. So I think small amounts that you can do often is the fastest way and also the most motivating way for me personally to like learn a new skill. Awesome, cool. I mean that that's really good advice for someone who's just getting into it. Because I I don't someone essentially asked in the in the Discord, like they said that they're they're nearly 30, they don't have a games art degree and they're a bit worried about like how they'd get started essentially. So I think starting off small modeling, maybe some small things from around the house in, in, in like a free software just so you get that sense of scale would kind of be helpful. But um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're coming to the end of this one, almost finished our time slot, but I'll, uh, I'll finish us up on a nice little question just to end. I'm going to ask you guys to tell me about a highlight from your career. Um, should we go around to Rory first and do la our last little loop? Yeah, um, I mean, like actually just releasing um, my first game of Battletoads was, 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 was pretty, pretty, was just incredible because I was able to watch people streaming it and like playing it on on Twitch, um, which was just like absolutely surreal. Just like any time of day was just bizarre. Um, but there's a specific highlight, which was in uh, 2019. The whole studio pretty much went to E3, um, and we and a few of us got to like sit in 
the Microsoft theater when the trailer was like shown. Like, so we were like sitting in amongst the crowd as it like went, you know, like went live. Um, and like, that was pretty, like pretty insane, you know, to sort of like be amongst the energy of like people who were excited for a game you were working on. That was like, I can still remember that so vividly. And also I was there for that Keanu Reeves meme being born. So oh, you were there for that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was there in the flight. Living history. <laughs> Awesome. That must, so, so were you massively like nervous the day before the release, or were you just like, "I'm cool, we got this." It's battle toads, like. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was terrifying. Uh, it's it's, oh. it's, it's, it's like really, it was really scary. But there was like, um, we hit a really good sort of momentum towards just before we released, where there was just lots of like excitement and like really positive kind of like um, vibes coming in about it, and um, we were all like really proud of the game and like um, what we managed to sort of like create, you know, in the time that we had, um, and it was like. A big learning experience for a lot of people at the studio um so yeah it was kind of like it was like a perfect blend of sort of like scared and like really you know excited it's oh, probably better awesome. to describe it that's grand so so what's next for you in the great scheme of things uh well we're, we're working on like a really exciting thing just now but i just can't, I can't, say. <laughs> I like, can't say a single word about it um but you that's know fair. Stay tuned. Um, it's, it's something that, like, it's definitely like a populist thing for me. I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Yeah. Games industry. <laughs> Lovely stuff. <laughs> Love some DMCs. <laughs> cool. So, Anya, what was a career highlight for you? Uh, I don't know if this might sound silly, but I just find there's, I feel like your career is a very kind of, it's often a slow progression. You might start out at one studio and work your way up to the next studio. And it, regardless of whether you're going from like a AAA studio to an indie studio, a freelance back to AAA or whatever, I just find every little thing that happens is just always such a highlight and a joy. Every little freelance gig that I get, I get really excited. Every game that gets released that I work on, uh, every time I can take a game that I worked on and put it in my portfolio, I just makes me so happy. So I don't really have one highlight, but I guess maybe the big, at least recent one for me was the day that I decide, well, I didn't decide, but the day that I went freelance, like a hundred percent, because it had been a kind of thing happening over the course of a year and a half or so where I was working full time, freelancing on the side, and then I went part time freelancing the other part of my time and then um just a few months ago or weeks ago what day is it um it's, uh, who knows thursday there we go but yeah I've, i'm finally sort of fully freelance and kind of looking at that and thinking about how long that i've been working towards it it's yeah it's pretty awesome it feels good <laughs> cool so uh, what are you working on at the moment? What's what's going forward for you? Uh, well, I've got about a thousand things under NDA, which is always fun, as okay. we know. <laughs> um, but yeah, most recently I was working on Everwild uh, with Rare. So I left Rare recently to go freelance. And so at the moment, uh, working with Gameloft, um, doing some NDA stuff for them. <laughs> um, I'm just about to take on a new contract um exciting. i have, haven't signed or anything yet but it's like a, a very exciting thing so i'm quite hyped about that so yeah all under nda and then i'm doing some personal work as well which is always a joy and that makes me very happy awesome great, great stuff great to hear and uh finally shay what's your career uh, highlight? if you hear any buzzing someone upstairs decides to like drill for half an hour every morning and i don't know why um oh, so I apologize. I was so that. worried. I had roadworks outside yesterday. And I was like, <laughs> finish by today, finish by today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's it's really random. Um so can I can I pick two? Because like one is like yeah, a personal thing and one okay, so like Anya, for me, there's a lot of joy in a lot of what I do. I think collaborating with people is what makes me happiest. Um so the the small one is recently Ratchet and Clank got released and I made Nefarious for that game and it's been so incredible how many simping accounts for him have come out and follow him and like love everything about him and 
that brings me a lot of joy is just the amount of love that he has as a character because I didn't know anything about the game. Um, I didn't know who he was or what the game was or anything. So when I was assigned to work on him, I was like, oh, a robot, cool. Okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, the baggage that came with that. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So then when I started researching it, researching into him and they released the first trailer and people have like him as his of their profile pictures and their accounts are completely surrounded by just him as a character. For me, that was like completely wild and weird. Um I still get DMs from people saying, like, did you make Nefarious and want to know everything about it? And I'm like, I didn't know anything about him, I swear. I just like did it. Um, so that was a highlight for me because it's as a freelancer, typically I don't share in a lot of like the release excitement because I'm working from thing to thing to thing. Um, but the biggest one for me is probably that I worked on a project with a few friends where we released a character rig for animators for free. Um, where I worked with a concept artist, I made the model, I worked with a rigger, we had some animators. Um, who all tested the rig before release and any money donated to the rig um, went to the, I think it's Trevor Foundation. Um, sometimes I get a uh, Trevor project, um, which is for LGBTQ and trans youth. Um, and we raised like 400 to almost 500 pounds for that charity. So, um, people using them and animating them and sending us videos and stuff, the money that was raised, being able to work with incredible people, which again is like a good networking thing. Um, I just posted on Twitter saying I was looking to work with people on a project where we would give something away for free. And I met a lot of really cool people through that. Um, and the concept artist I was a big fan of for a long time. So I just DM'd him saying, do you want to do this thing? And now we're good friends. So. I think that's another good wow. way to like that's, that's amazing people. as well yeah yeah <laughs> like a, a lot of people hero. i know <laughs> yeah i was just like i love your work and i think it'd be cool if we worked together on something and he was like i love your work let's do something so it was <laughs> wow, it was really exciting feeling. yeah so that's probably the biggest highlight of my career was doing that with lots of cool people oh fantastic awesome yeah well we're, we're about at our time now for the panel but yeah um i hope Hope everyone was be able to take something away from that. We've managed to get some amazing portfolio feedback and um, some tips and tricks for getting into industry. Yeah. Um, so basically, thank you for coming along, everyone. So stay around on the live stream. We've got some amazing new uh, things coming up next. We coming up right next is a studio presentation by Creative Assembly. I mean, there's a little company might have heard of them. Uh, <laughs> they're kind of a big deal, which is which is really cool to have them with us showing off their studio. And yeah, feel free to join the Discord and come and chat with some amazing developers. Um, are any of you speakers heading to Discord at all? Uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the creative portfolios. So if people nice. tag me directly, then I'll know which ones to actually talk about. Um, but yeah, that's where I'll be. Very nice stuff. I'll be lurking because I can't seem to get mine to work. Um, <laughs> but it, I am there. I just can't talk because of some weird Discord issue. But I am watching and listening. Nice. <laughs> Skynet moment. <laughs> yeah, I'll be able to jump on for a bit um, in a little while. So yeah, same with Shade. Just tag, just tag me if there's any, any portfolios or anything I don't want to uh, look at. Oh, well, thank you so much, you three, for coming along. Really, really good advice. Awesome, awesome to talk to you guys.